We are going to introduce a theory of classical elementary spinning particles. It is a set of six lectures in which uh, the first one, this one, we are going to introduce the fundamental principles in which uh, this formalism is based upon. Because one of the fundamental principles is going to be a variational principle and therefore a Lagrangian description of elementary particles, the second lecture will be devoted to a mathematical property of the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is a homogeneous function of the derivatives of the boundary variables of the variational principle. This manifold, the manifold of the boundary variables, is always a metric space for any arbitrary mechanical system, and this structure, this metric structure, is analyzed in the third lecture. With this metric structure, we shall produce the equivalent description that the variational formalism is equivalent to a geodesic a statement on this manifold of states. The four lecture, because we have a Lagrangian for describing an elementary particle, we shall analyze this important theorem, Noether's theorem, to construct for some particular elementary particle, the fundamental observables, like energy, linear momentum, angular momentum, spin, and so on. And the, the last two lectures will be devoted to the analysis of two particular examples of elementary spinning particles. One is the electron, another is the photon. And we shall see that when quantizing both objects, the electron will be an object of a spin a half and the photon of a spin one. Okay, let us begin with the first lecture, and the classical theory is based upon these three fundamental principles. First, a restricted relativity principle. The idea of this is to define what are the class of equivalent observers for which we are going to establish the dynamical laws of the mechanical systems. The second is the variational principle, which by this method of the calculus of variations, we can construct, we can build the dynamical laws. And finally, the atomic principle is the definition of elementary particle. The idea is that we assume that in nature, every portion of matter cannot be divided indefinitely. At the end, we have an ultimate object, which is what we call an elementary particle, and we will give a mathematical definition of it. And this definition is part of the fundamental principles. Okay, the, the, the restricted relativity principle is stated in this form. We assume that there exists a class of equivalent observers for which they describe the physical laws in the same form. The dynamical laws are written in the same form in every uh, reference frame. One of the laws that is satisfied for every equivalent observer is the law of inertia. The law of inertia means that for some particular observer, a, bo a, a, a body is free if it is at rest or it is moving at a constant velocity. But if the law of inertia is satisfied for the whole class of equivalent observers, we call them inertial observers. Therefore, if a body, if everybody is is free for one inertial observer, it is free for every, for every other inertial observer, and this implies that the inertial observers are either at rest with respect to each other, perhaps with different orientations of their Cartesian frames, and moving at a constant velocity. This relative velocity, nevertheless, by this criterion, is not unrestricted. In fact, we know that there exists a velocity limit for the motion of the inertial observers, and therefore, when we consider different observers, for instance, an accelerated observer, this is left outside the class of equivalent observers because a free body for an accelerated observer, a body at rest in that frame, is not a free body for us because we, we see that body moving with some acceleration. Now, the First idea is that if the velocity among inertial observers is restricted to this value, that this velocity is below 
this universal constant C, then the relationship between two inertial observers, O and O prime, is given by this linear relation. It looks a little bit complex, but uh, gamma of B is the relativistic factor. And we have here the time and position T, TR, are the measurement of some space-time event performed by O. T prime and R prime are the same and the values obtained by O prime of the same space-time event, and G, which is represented by these 10 numbers, is the action of this Poincaré group transformation. This, uh, this idea is the same as this block, which represents what are the relationship between the two space-time event measurements between two arbitrary initial observers. We have these 10 real numbers which appear here, B represents the time translation, A, the space translation, B is going to be the velocity of O as measured by U prime, and R or alpha is a rotation matrix between these two inertial reference frames. These 10 values are measurements performed by O prime of the reference frame of O. And therefore, these 10 numbers represent to any other inertial observer. The whole class of this set of 10 numbers completely exhausts all possible inertial reference frames. For particular, 0000, 0, 0, 0 represents the O prime frame itself. Now, you see that, let us consider that O and O prime are at rest with respect to each other, and the matrix R alpha is written as the three unit vectors of O as measured by O prime, taken by columns, we construct this three by three unit, a uh, three by three orthogonal matrix, and alpha will be the essential parameters which characterize this uh, rotation matrix. Now O is boosted with velocity V, so V is the velocity of the origin of O reference frame as measured by O prime, and finally, B and A are the instant and position of the origin of the reference frame O when the clock of O shows zero. Imagine, for instance, that O sends a message, a message to O prime and says, I have a lamp at my origin, and when my clock shows zero, the lamp will flash. That measurement with T0,0 zero, zero will give us T0, zero, R0, zero, T prime is B, 0, 0, 0, R prime is A. So the set of these 10 numbers are measurements performed by O prime of the reference frame of O. Okay. Now the second fundamental principle is the variational principle as stated in the following form. We have any arbitrary mechanical system which is in some initial state x1 and follows a trajectory in this space x and arrives to the final state x2. Now this postulate what means is for any mechanical system the path followed by the mechanical system is that one which makes that the action is a maximum or a minimum. What is the action? Will we define it a little bit later. But the action of the system between the initial and final state has to reach a maximum or a minimum. Now we, we shall call these variables which define the boundary variables of this variational description kinematical variables. And this manifold the kinematical space or space state of the system. Now, to, to define the action, we are going to define first what we call the Lagrangian of any mechanical system. Every mechanical system is characterized by a function, L, L which is called the Lagrangian, which is a function of time, of the n degrees of freedom, QA, and their time derivatives after a finite order, K. Well, we, we are used that for describing the, the point particle, we stop here.
and our Lagrangian only depends on the time, on the position of the point, and on the time derivatives, the first time derivative for the position, so that the velocity. But at this stage of the formalism, we don't know what are the classical variables to describe in a spinning particle. So we, we cannot restrict the Lagrangian to the dependence on only on the first order derivatives of these unknown variables. It will be uh, the, the atomic principle which will restrict at, to what order of derivation will uh, stop the dependence of the Lagrangian on the different degrees of freedom. So, if we produce a variational formalism with this kind of Lagrangian, the boundary variables, the kinematical variables are precisely the time, the degrees of freedom, the degrees of freedom evaluated at the time t, up to the, deriv the derivation of order k minus 1, to one order less that they appear in the Lagrangian. And conversely, if we know what are the variables which define the initial and final state of any arbitrary mechanical system, the Lagrangian will be a function of all these variables and their next order time derivative. Now, to produce a canonical formalism, the generalized coordinates are precisely all these kinematical variables with the time excluded. So all these coordinates will have associated a conjugate momentum. Now, for instance, the initial or final state of the point particle is characterized by time and position. T1, R1 are the initial time and position, T2 and R2 the final position, so that the Lagrangian for describing a point particle will be a function of time, position, and the next time derivative, which is the velocity of the point. But in general, if we know the kinematical variables, the Lagrangian will be a function of the next order time derivative. Now, the action of the system, if we know the Lagrangian, is the integral along some particular path of this Lagrangian. When we introduce there some particular path starting from x1 to x2, so this integral is a functional. It depends on the path we introduce here, and this gives you a number. This number will depend on the path followed by the, by the system. But the real path, what the variational formalism states, is that if the action has to be maximum or minimum, this path has to satisfy the Euler's Lagrange equations. So this path q tilde of t is that path which makes this value a maximum or a minimum. You see that this is a system of ordinary differential equations for the nth degrees of freedom, but up to order 2k. Now, if we want to find solutions of this system, we are tempted to introduce only boundary conditions and the initial time. But this is a wrong statement. Our statement is that the boundary conditions for the solution are that the path starts from x1 and arrives to x2. Uh, this is what, what we have to enhance the role of the kinematical variables to make a Lagrangian description where these kinematical variables play a dominant role. These differential equations have one restriction that they will be invariant under the Poincaré group. This will imply some transformation properties of the Lagrangian, and in particular, for an elementary particle, the Lagrangian will be an invariant function for the whole class of inertial observers, and therefore this conclusion implies that the dynamical equations will also be a relativistic invariant. Now, the canonical conjugate momenta of these generalized coordinates are defined in this uh, formalism of generalized uh, Lagrangian dynamics in this form, where PIS is the conjugate momentum of the coordinate QIS. Now, once the path which makes the action minimum or maximum, this path Q tilde T, is introduced into the Lagrangian, and we make this integral 
This integral will be a function of the initial time, initial point, and the final point on the kinematical space. So this function is called the action function of the system. This function which has some value, this is a minimum value of the functional integral, but it is an explicit function, of course, of some uh, intrinsic parameters which appear here, like masses, charges, and spins, but only of the kinematical variables of the initial and final point. And also satisfies this requirement that the action between a point and itself must vanish. This is important because if we know the action, if we know the action function for any arbitrary mechanical system, the Lagrangian can be constructed by this limiting process. And this Lagrangian will be a homogeneous function of first degree of the two derivatives of all the kinematical variables. Now, the action function in this way, characterizes the, characterizes the dynamics in a global way, because if we know this action function, we obtain the Lagrangian, and from the Lagrangian, we obtain the dynamical equations. Now, let's go to the third fundamental principle, the atomic principle. The atomic principle represents the idea that elementary matter exists. So, an elementary matter, in addition to be indivisible, it is the ultimate object of the addition of matter, it is also a system which cannot be deformed. It has no excited states. This is the idea we have about an elementary particle. If you take a, a piece of matter and try to divide, before the, the breaking that into two parts, we deform it. But if we have reached this ultimate object and you try to divide, because it has no internal part, it has no, it's not a composite system of any other things, it cannot be the form. So this is the basic idea contained in the idea of what an elementary matter should be from the classical point of view, so that in, in this space, if we start from some state x1 and reaches the state x, if it is not the form, the values of these variables are exactly the same values of this, but we measure for a different initial observer. When I act on some particle and its state has been modified, if its internal structure has never changed, I can always find some initial observer who, located with respect to that particle, will describe at that instant, the elementary particle with the same values, for instance, and the initial state. So the values of, of, of this state in this moment of the evolution can be obtained by a simple change of initial observer by applying the corresponding element of the Poincaré group to the initial state. And this feature for all intermediate states and even for the final state. So, the evolution is just like a Poincaré transformation of the initial state. This is a very strong constraint in this idea of elementary particle and therefore gives us the mathematical definition of a classical elementary particle. Classical elementary particle is a Lagrangian system whose kinematical space, the space of states, is always a homogeneous space of the kinematical group associated to the restricted relativity principle. In our case, it's a homogeneous space of the Poincaré group. Now, the, the mathematical statement is homogeneous space of a group. A manifold is a homogeneous space of a group, a group which transforms points of that manifold. If given two arbitrary points of that manifold, Either this exists a group element which transforms them. This is what happens here because all points, all the states of the of the particle are transformations of any one of them. And this is the idea associated to 
this atomic principle. It is very restrictive because the, the most complex elementary particle from the classical point of view cannot have more variables than the parameters of the group because the, the largest homogeneous space of the group is the group itself. So the maximum number of classical variables to describe an elementary particle are precisely the kind of variables we use to describe the elements of the group. So, because the Poincaré group is a 10-parameter group, the maximum number of classical variables to describe a classical elementary particle is 10, of the same kind and dimensions as the group parameters. Therefore, the possible more complex elementary particle will be characterized by these 10 variables. A time, the position of a point, the velocity of that point, and the orientation of a, of a Cartesian frame attached to that point, u, is the velocity. Therefore, these are called the time, position of a point, velocity of that point, and orientation of a moving frame attached to that point. This, of course, represents a mechanical system of six degrees of freedom, three, but in the kinematical variables, we also have the velocity of that point. And the other three degrees of freedom are the orientation of a commoving frame. This means that the most general Lagrangian for this system will depend on the time, the position, the velocity, the next time derivative of the velocity, that is the acceleration, or the orientation, and the derivative of the orientation, which is the angular velocity. Therefore, the differential equations for the point R will be fourth order. The differential equations will, for the orientation variables will be of second order, the usual Euler equations for the rotation of a body. Therefore, this point is not going to be interpreted at the center of mass of the elementary particle, but it will represent the center of charge of the particle. Now, this is the most general representation of a classical elementary spinning particle. It is a localizable system at this point, which will represent the center of charge, and we have attached a Cartesian co-moving, rotating of a reference frame of orientation alpha. It's an arbitrary system. The point R satisfies fourth order differential equations, while the orientation are of second order. While well, this formalism has been developed in this monography, in this paper which published this idea of the ato atomic uh, hypothesis, and we can also discharge these two documents of a lecture course I, I lecture at the University of West Country, or you can contact me on this email. The next lecture will be the analysis of this most general Lagrangian in principle for arbitrary mechanical systems, and we will see that the Lagrangian is always a homogeneous function of first degree of the derivatives of the kinematical variables. Thank you very much for your attention.